John, I don't know if you want to take it from here or Joe, I'd even hand it over to you. I'd love maybe you, if you want to give John an intro. Well, John is probably one of the, the most driven, innovative guys that I think I've ever met. You know, I, I met John originally, he was selling compost bins out the back of his apartment in Ojai, California. And he went from there to developing protein powders and shakes. And from there, he launched Nativa. And Nativa became a $100 million operation that John single-handedly brought to, to market. So one of the most amazing guys I've met for a while. And just a great friend and a good human being with a big heart. So that's John Rulak. Excellent. Well, thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining. So, uh, John, I'll kind of hand it over if you want to do, you know, take it from there. Sure. Well, thanks, Joe. And yeah, it's, that's the great thing about life. We, we, we get to meet a lot of interesting people. And, and for, for better or worse, I tend to follow and focus on projects that, you know, that I think are, are you know, speak to me, you know, sometimes that are, that are hard to do. I mean, hemp is, is, is one of those. And sometimes it gets you in, in a, a fair bit of trouble or challenges, and but it's it's kind of how I, I kind of kind of like to, to roll. And I got involved in this regen movement a bit. I was you know CEO of Nativa. We we were funding a lot of like non GMO and go, you know doing campaigns against glyphosate in Monsanto. We put one hundred forty thousand comments on uh, on Cheerios Facebook wall and and forced them to remove GMOs from their because they were using GMO corn and sugar. I think the Sugar Beet Growers Association of, of the U.S. Or, or North America were, were upset. I don't know if they knew it was, I, was, I was the one that, that you know, was focusing on cratering their market share. But, but after a while, we decided that, that just focusing on that you know, GMOs are bad or glyphosate is bad or big ag, you know, et cetera, that maybe we could focus on soil health and I, I heard a presentation by a great organic farmer named Will Allen that, that's in Vermont. And he's got a farm up there in northern, near, near Dartmouth College on the other side of the river there. And he just, he gave a whole presentation all about the greenhouse gas emissions of chemical fertilizers, you know, the, how much food and ag, industrial food and ag con contribution to climate change or pollution. You know, one of the one of the things talks about that. I'm right, just thinking about this is that you notice how the environmental movement we stop talking about pollution and we only talk about climate change, and and it's really a weakness of our movement. I don't I, I, I don't come across anyone across the political spectrum that thinks pollution is a good idea, but when you talk about climate change, it goes into a it goes into a political positioning, and and you know. You know, isn't it? Isn't there an irony? There was some Facebook post recently I saw. There's 1,500 jets parked in Davos, Switzerland, private jets, and they're going to tell us that you know that you know that we need to uh, to eat insect burgers and you know change our change our lifestyle. <laughs> so you know the climate movement's got kind of a bad rap in that in that way. But uh, so but in any case, the uh, it was really interesting that. Back in back, this was about 2013, 14. That when I when I would go to the natural food shows, Expo West, you know, when I go to the organic farming, no one was talking about soil health as an important issue. And when we think about all the legacy load, and 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 that kind of led me to do the to do this film because no one, how, how is it that all these organic hippie farmers are not talking about soil health, and they had very little interest in regenerative ag? And I'm like, literally, you're like my mentors. You're like the ones I've been learning at, you know, since of my twenties, you know, my heroes. And you're like, we don't not going to talk about soil health, just talk about organic, you know. And and so that led me to do a film. I said, we've got to do a film and then met the filmmakers, Josh and Rebecca and, and Rylan from Kiss the Ground. And we ended up doing the film Kiss the Ground to share the story. And, and now I, I laughed. I read in Bloomberg, they said that the, the CEO of Cargill says that the, that the, the hot topic at, at, at Davos were, you know, all the all the different 
leaders and different investors and you know you know you can have all sorts of opinions on 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 what's really driving them and and there's a lot of things we could go down the rabbit hole we'll probably probably not do here today but you know as joe says you know probably don't get me started he, he said that the ceo of cargill you know that little agricultural company based in minnesota that regenerative agriculture and farming was the big topic and he'd never seen that ever before so i kind of laughed that you know the, this regen movement you know from a few hundred of us you know eight years ago and now now people are flying around in private jets to learn about regenerative agriculture so anyways that's uh the other thing i wanted to mention is some of the projects i've been working on is great plains regeneration which is working in in the in the midwest in the in the great plains region to, with farmers and ranchers so you can learn more about that and then my latest project is is agroforestry regeneration communities or arc and it kind of came out from my work i i have a i have a fund that i support nonprofit projects all over uh, all over the the world and a couple of them were involved in tree planting projects and they seem to be doing the best like or doing very well and, and I was excited about it because they're they're creating food for us so I created an, an umbrella organization we're going to be doing a webinar June 9th and we put in and we don't start existing pro, we don't start projects up we work with existing programs and essentially we're taking an agricultural system I was just talking to the one of the, the people from Farmers Footprint maybe some of you have heard of Farmers Footprint it's a really good NGO they were saying how do we explain agroforestry you know to the to the layperson so I said, first off, we don't call it agroforestry. So we call it food forests. So the existing model requires inputs. These small farmers, whether it's in Malawi, in Africa, you know, that has 16 million, 18 billion people, to Guatemala, where we work with, they're, they're requ that requires right now to grow the food in those countries and in places all over the world requires lots of inputs, synthetic fertilizers, which Bill Gates is pushing, you know, and, and it requires other inputs and it requires really ideal weather, right, the right amount of rain at the right time. What we do, we're saying that model is, is failing. One is, is, you know, Putin controls 25% of the world fertilizer and, he, and he's not going to sell it to the West anymore. And he's not going to sell wheat and he's not going to sell. There's going to be a lot of things that are going to be changing in our system. You know, we're, I, I find that those, those who listen to CNN or Fox are very badly misinformed on what's going on in the world affairs today. At, at our detriment, you know, but the idea is, is requiring inputs uh, or, you know, thinking that ships of, of wheat are going to arrive to the port and you can just go down to some concrete box and get your food. You know, that's been, that didn't exist with our great grandparents and it's probably not going to exist in 10 to 20 years at our, at our current rate. But the idea back to food for us is that it, it essentially, mo it mimics the natural forest system. So when you when you walk through a lush forest, is are they irrigating it? Is there any ir irrigation piping through a forest? Is there anhydrous ammonia or urea fertilizers? Are they or is there you know are the bears running the you know that fertilizer system with synthetics? I don't think so. And yet it's very lush. So we essentially mimic the forest and and and, and it works very well in the global south because you have more rainfall and and, it, and it's in the tropics things grow faster so we can essentially go from a area where it's essentially you know slash and burn monocrop and just by planting combination of nitrogen fixing trees native trees and, and food producing trees and alley crops such as ginger turmeric pineapple, cassava, sugarcane, we can create food abundance. And we just, there was just a tour in Guatemala with, with my co-founder, Hannah, and uh, several people from the team and some scientists. And the people just, the, these, these people are marginalized. They've been discriminated against the, from the, you know, the Spanish conquistadors from 500 years ago, where where they basically came and, 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 you know, subjugated them and stole their lands. And so it's, I feel as a, as a, a privileged, wealthy Caucasian that was been very successful in business to be able to support that. So we have 2000 families now that have these food forests in Guatemala 
and I got a grant, and this is the great thing about LinkedIn. One thing I'd encourage you, if you're interested in regenerative agriculture, you wanna be on LinkedIn. I can't get any traction on Facebook. I'm, I'm basically deplatformed from Facebook and Google. They, they basically, not deplatformed, but shadow banning me. They, they make sure my, none of my posts get, go, you know, people see it a lot. But on LinkedIn, I can get, get a lot more exposure. And someone reached out to me, said, oh, you should reach someone. You should talk to someone. We've got a $400,000 grant. So we're going to plant 500,000 of these trees, about 3,000 food forests this year in Guatemala. So feel really good about that. One of the things that we're doing also is we're growing cassava as a as a as an alley crop, and cassava is a tuber. Many of you you probably had cassava chips. It's very popular in in, in Africa. It uh, grows a lot. We're now making jackfruit cassava pizzas at a center that we have in, in Antigua, Guatemala, that we recently opened. So uh, I'll uh, I'll turn it back to you, Mandy. That's a uh, that's a little a little my rant here to start with. I love it. So I, of course, now want to go back to where does hemp fit into all of this, right? Understanding a lot of, you know, the regions and territories and genetics are still being worked out. But I'm kind of curious from your perspective, what has been your experience with hemp and the benefits to its, you know, root structure and, you know, carbon sequestration? Yeah. Well, I, I would say from a, just from a, from more of a permaculture food security issue i think that hemp would do really well in an alley crop system in in agroforestry and other crops you know especially you know you know nitrogen fixing crops and you know the further you are farther to the south the easier that's going to be and i think ultimately just growing the hemp at a, even at a small scale and putting tarps out and shaking the hemp plant and getting the seeds I think that's at a small scale when when things when food becomes scarce. I think that's going to be a really interesting uh, uh, opportunity. At a large scale, I mean, Joe and I have been at this for a long time with hemp, and the challenge is hemp can do a lot of things. And I've written several books on hemp back in the '90s, and and have been to my to my fair share of of conferences and symposiums from you know, experts in the hemp field to agronomists to leading fiber companies. And just because hemp can make 25,000 products doesn't mean you can actually build an industry with those. And so unfortunately, there's a lot of what I call hype in hemp, sometimes too much hype. So like, for instance, because of all the restrictions, like for instance, example, Canada, Canada dominates in hemp food. Just because we can grow hemp in the United States doesn't mean that we're going to all of a sudden grow a lot of hemp for food in the U.S. right away because because the, the economics, Canada's already been there. They have an advantage of the Canadian dollar. It's, ex, you know, and they already have the agronomic, you know, and infrastructure. Though I did see an interesting innovative hemp product. I know uh, Revolution Hemp is doing some really interesting things by by shelling the seed and then crushing it for oil. The, pr the, the resulting protein is unlike any other protein powders. I've formulated protein powder products, you know, it's much better than, 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 uh, than pea. The challenge is the cost is, is very expensive. To me, the, one of the, 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 the potentials is we need to increase the yield per acre of hemp seed. I mean, if you, if you look at, if we'd increased the yield of hemp in the last 10 years, what, what, you know, corn has done since the 1950s, hemp would be planted a lot more. I mean, corn yields have increased so much. So we, we really, we need to invest in that. So I, I see a real opportunity there. And then can you create value with the shells? You know, with, there's talk about graphene and other, other things. And, but I saw a baby formula company. I don't know, Mandy, have you heard about this? There's a I've heard about baby formula, but there's a there's a baby baby formula with the hemp protein. This from from uh, you know from that and and also with the hemp oil and MCT oil and cassava. And that was interesting. I'm trying to someone someone just alerted me to it. The the other thing is if you can get the markets right for hemp but those are challenges with the processing hurdles and and and, and investment etc but one 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 thing that 
people don't seem to, to be aware of and don't hear as much as I remember in England, if you grew hemp and then you follow up with, with winter wheat, and winter wheat is obviously a, a big crop, that the, they were noticing the yield of winter wheat was like up 20%. Um, we need more you know, research and studies on that. Be and I think it's because of the weed suppression is partly, and, and, maybe, and maybe some of the other benefits on the, at the, and the soil health. So that's- Well, a that's really there. where I'm curious, right? Is when you get into rotation, you know, what, what are we seeing on, on effects of the rotation, corn, wheat, you know, and back to the baby formula, the shortage of baby formula now, you, we would think that, you know, the type of protein that hemp is and as digestible as it is that we would have it in baby formula. I'm yeah, just about this. yeah, yeah. It, there's a lot of regulations res restricting that. But yeah, there's there's some 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 interesting opportunities there. But I'm not quite sure how this company has gotten through the I don't even know if it's even being sold in the marketplace, but but they have a formulation. Yeah. That's awesome. So can you can you speak a little bit to that rotation, you know, working it in in the rotation and maybe what is needed to really gather gather the data or what is the data that's missing to really bring it to scale, hemp to scale for purposes of increased yields? I mean, and soil health itself compared to these. Yeah, I'm I'm just going to see if I can see this. It, the, the company is called Hembal, H-E-M-B-A-L. That's the that's the baby food company with uh, with the hemp, Hembal. I don't know if it's uh, if it's on the market. They're out of Joplin, Missouri. Just just got a text on. Just got a LinkedIn message this morning. Yeah, maybe somebody can put it in the comments. And, and I have no idea. I just no idea what their status is. If they can even s sell it. Yet, you know, because there's a lot of lot of issues around formulation. The other thing, the other shortage is, guess who controls ninety percent of the world's sunflower oil? Ooh. Ukraine and Russia, and that's and that's not coming into the formula products now, and yet not hardly not New York Times or CNN or NPR will not talk about that. So 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 let's let's uh, yeah respond to you. They talked, I remember in some of the literature, and I don't know, I, 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 I wrote a book called Hemp Horizons, which you can buy used. I, I wrote it in 1997, but in, in a way, I mean, things have changed. We didn't know about CBD, but things, you know, they're still the same issues. So you could, if you want, if you're interested, you might want to, you might want to Google that. Yeah, it says Hembel is only for export only. Yeah, yeah, probably because of the regulation of the FDA. But, you know, a lot of the research showed that Hemp was really considered a really good break crop and to cleanse a field of weeds. It'll outrun Johnson grass. The key thing is to get water in, in the first few weeks. If, if you can get some moisture, it'll outrun Canadian thistle, etc. So it's, it's ideal there because, you know, herbis, you know, weed issue, weed pressure is a big issue. So I think it's got some good potential there. But again, it's only going to be effective if you have a market to sell it. And, and that's, and that's, you know, th those are some, some challenges there, <clears throat> but, but as a, for, for weed control rotation, I think it's really good. And that's got, some, got some, it's got a deep tap root and it also keeps the soil cooler and moist because it's, it's not grown in rows. It's it covers the whole field and, and the leaves are high in nitrogen. So it's, it's, you know, it's kind of, it's like that leaf fall. It's kind of like a mini, <clears throat> mini little forest ecosystem, you know, where it's falling there. The big thing though, is I think the challenges are yield. We need to increase the yield. You're, you're, unless you increase the yield, in my view, hemp is not gonna be a significant crop in the US. You have to, if you can increase the yield by 50%, it would, it, would, it would be a game changer. I mean, it's literally just, you know, when you shell, it's just the yield is so low from shelling and then the cost is so high. And, and also I think you need the, I think you need the pedigreed seed some foundation needs to come in and just say we're going to make we're going to make planting seed available not you know at a, at a very reasonable price point that's what we really need you can't you know i don't know what it costs right now but you know and if you're paying you know i've been out of it for a while but if you're paying a dollar or, or two dollars for the seed you know dollar fifty for the planting seed uh, it's and, about four dollars three four dollars for cbd or for or for for yeah, fiber yeah for, yeah example like that's that like right there that's like a pound 
Yeah, that's that's like a non that's a non starter. Economically, that's just not very very good. It's just too expensive. And if it's a bad crop, if it's if it's if you get like a drought, and it doesn't make it, you've just made a huge investment. So so really, you know, you got to find one of these gazillionaires to fund the seed breeding and you know make make the seed available at a reasonable price. Um, I'm seeing some questions. What I'm talking about the grain. So yeah, the 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 seed or the grain it's you know it's 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 got a good protein it's technically not a complete protein but you know when i'll just i'll maybe i'll be politically incorrect one of my competitors manitoba harvest put it out as as as, as a complete protein and then everybody started repeating it but but you know when we did the studies that nahc and other groups did you know it didn't come out as a complete protein it's it's close but not not really a complete protein and you know that's one of the things when you make misleading claims just to gain advantage in the marketplace you know it comes back to bite you and so people don't take the hemp movement as seriously because of those things um, um but it, it is it, it has a very good you know edison pro, the protein quality is is as important as quote the complete protein the edison protein the albumin protein it's very easy to digest it's also very rich in magnesium zinc and iron uh, which most americans are short in i mean magnesium is involved in several hundred biochemical processes you know, and uh, so so it's got it's got a lot of potential, but again, hemp it's not like it's not like a hip crop anymore. Back in back when I was working on it ten years ago, everybody you know, like, well, you get a bag of hemp seeds. That was a big thing, you know. You know, it's not as, as not as much today. You know, and you can see some 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 pointers. I would say so. I've been a little bearish on hemp for fiber. Um, the, I would say. In the last year, year and a half, things have started to change because of the because of shipping costs of fuel, because of other fiber shortages, et cetera. Hemp is the economics are starting to get a little better. And I think someone said I disagree on the fiber fiber issue. It depends on the market segment and end user barrier of our entry. Yeah, use of our regenerative cotton and hemp fiber increased our cogs by less than sixteen cents per conventional material. Okay, that was uh, Claire. Good, good, good comment there. And it, but again, if you can, if we can take cost out of the production, which is better yields and and, and lower lower seed seed costs, you know, the pedigreed seed or planting seed, that's going to make a big difference. Oh, I have another question, real quick, that somebody turned in or Karen Karen wrote has a question. She says that as since hemp is a bioremediator, there's a lot of conversation about hemp being organic if it's for food, animal feed, textiles, for human contact. Can you speak a little bit about the differences between regenerative and organic practices for growth? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of the one of the you know it's 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 interesting. Like people say, well, grow grow hemp. Because it's a bioremediator, it's going to clean up your fields. But if you're growing your hemp in contaminated fields, where do you think those contaminants, where do they end up in? In the seed. You know, we got, so there, there can be higher, and, and it's not 1850 anymore. So there's higher levels of, of like, uh, you know, of like, maybe not, I don't know about cadmium, but, but you know, definitely iron and certain things. You know, rice is similar to that. So you have to, you have to be, you know, there's, you know, what the quality of soil is, is, is an issue there, but it definitely accumulates what's in there. In terms of the difference between organic and regenerative. So yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, that could be a long conversation. You know, organic primarily has talks about what it doesn't do. Doesn't use synthetic fertilizer, doesn't use pesticides, doesn't use herbicides. And, and ironically, and I wouldn't have said this 10 years ago, but farmers that are organic, a lot of times their soil health is worse than farmers who are no tilling that are still using agricultural chemicals. That was like, wow, mm. people don't want to admit that. Not a fan, not a fan of, of, of Roundup, you know, not a fan of, of synthetic fertilizers, but so as Ray Archuleta likes to say, the no-tillers need to spend time on spraying less and the organic people need to till less. <laughs> and maybe we can meet in the middle. <laughs> and that's what Roy, that's what Roy, what's his, not Roy, but uh, there's an Indiana farmer, Clark. I'm trying to remember his name. 6,500 acres 
of organic no-till, you know, uh, crops uh, such as corn, soy, etc. Rick Clark, thank you, Eric Jackson. So, if you want to really learn about a different way of farming, he's he's phenomenal. So, so yeah, definitely uh, learn about him. Awesome. I don't know if there's any other questions that you see in here that you want that you're addressing. I was just yeah. catching up. Yeah. On. Someone had a good point. You know, regenerative is when farming system is accumulating carbon. Yeah. You know, you're, you're adding organic matter. One, one interesting thing is for every 1% increase in organic matter in the soil, guess how much water is stored anywhere from 20 to 25,000 gallons per acre. We could be storing, tr you know, trillions of gallons of water. It, this is not rocket science. And the irony is they've been talking about this soil. We've been talking about the soil health, you know, you know, since the 90s, 80s. And it's still treated as some new thing, you know. Yeah, so definitely we need to do to do better. The simplest thing would be to pay farmers to do a cover crop. But instead, we're going to get into some convoluted carbon counting, which, you know, there's less opportunity to store carbon, you know, in drier soils and in drier areas, you know, versus other areas, uh, you know, and you can, you can goose the carbon and then change it after the counting. It's going to create a lot of issues. But unfortunately, in Washington, D.C., you know, it's not, policy is not based on logic and reason. It's based on money and power. There is a movement, though, to try to change that called Regenerate America. How many people have heard about Regenerate America? Maybe you can tag, maybe you can put that in the, in the uh, maybe a link to it. And this is part of the Kiss the Ground project. And, and we're, we're working, and one of the benefits is they got a very conservative Republican, conservative-leaning member of Congress in Iowa, can't remember his name, and... Ray Arch, we got him and Ray Archuleta to go out in the field and, and, and kiss the ground and regenerate America, set this up. And, and after that, he was very, like, very interested. He was like, wow, because a lot of these people in Washington, D.C., yeah, they're, they, they, they're there because they got elected and they raise a lot of money and, you know, big ag's part of that. But at the same time, you know, they have kids, they have grandchildren. You know, they, they they don't want pollution. You know, they may not necessarily agree with the world's going to come to an end because of climate change. But and so if we can reach out to them and, you know, the great thing about regenerative agriculture, it's not a blue state issue. It's not a red state issue. It's not a conservative issue. It's not a liberal issue. It's not a it's not a Tea Party issue. It's not a woke issue. You know, you know, it's a it's a it's a it impacts all of us and it's bringing together a lot of interesting people. So, uh, you know, regeneration is, is the future. There's a great book, uh, Joe Hick, I mean, Paul Hawken wrote on regeneration. You may want to check it out. I was, I was, I was going to give you a shout out, Joe, but, uh, but, uh, and I see someone else said the, 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 it also has a big deep tap root. So yeah, so it can break up some of the hard pan soil, the tap root, which is really good. What's your take on biochar and the benefits towards regenerative farming? Yeah, that's a, so it's interesting. Two years ago, if you would have asked me, I said, uh, there's a lot of people who either love it or do not like it. It's kind of controversial. And I just, it was something I didn't really focus on, like as a, as a subject or a specific area. You know, I'm kind of a generalist and, and I know a lot about little, you know, which can get me into trouble, you know. Um, you know, I mean, I could talk to a science about soil health, but at a certain point that, you know, they're, they, you know, they can, uh, they can really get into the, into the weeds on that. So in, I think biochar has a, a role to play. Actually, one of the, where I live in, in Washington state, one of the farmers got a $30,000 machine to take x we need we have a lot of excess fiber from from tree trimmings and tree thinnings and, and they're putting like one part biochar make it a soil amendment with three parts compost and two parts you know small forest debris i'm actually working on a on a on a on a cpg lawn and garden project you know just kind of an, as an ideation we haven't launched it or anything and i'm looking to put 10 percent of the mix in with biochar and 5% worm castings and some humates. And essentially it, it, 
you know, it kind of, you know, but people say it kind of creates, it's like building a condominium for the critters and, and, cons- and for, you know, for water. So that's, that's some benefits, you know, with, with biochar. Maybe Mandy, you can put also the link by our agroforestry regeneration project. And again, we're going to have a, we're going to have a, uh, I'm going to grab a product here. We're going to have a, uh, a workshop on a uh, webinar on June 9th. And one thing I want to show you, look, look at this right here. This is a, this is a liquid product made from, from almond shells in the central Valley of California, California. And basically it's a proprietary process. It's called Corrigin and they make biochar and then as a byproduct, they get this liquid. Um, and it's, it's kind of, you've probably heard of wood vinegar, some of you. So it's a more refined, and it's, it's very high in phenols, and it's very good for plant growth, and it can help um, some disease plants and plant stimulation. I'm, I'm associated with an organization called Penny Newman. It's a billion-dollar-a-year company in California. I've been having some discussions and know some of the people there. They're going to sell 100,000 gallons of this. This And this is based on a circular economy, taking a crop you grow, take the byproduct you can't use, the shells, convert it through a circular, you know, you know, bio-based system. And, and, and they're going to sell 100,000 gallons to almond growers and pistachio growers, tomato growers to stimulate growth. Well, does that work similar to help or does it help as... I've heard a lot of discussion around seed wash and or organic pesticides that have a vinegar base. Is that related at all? I mean, it's, it's a phenol that it's, that it, you know, right now there are bio-based products that can, you know, deal with the issues we feel in agriculture. Nature has the answer, you know, Nature has the answer. Here's a couple of good things I want to riff off. Eric Jackson, a missed opportunity is that regenerative space to be connection between soil health and crop nutrient density. Very good point. There's a lot of there's a lot of work on that in the Bionutrient Association as has been researching this for, for years, but the more nutrient dense. So when you when you when you you know our farmers really are, should be our doctors, you know, and they're really supply. They're helping. If you treat the soil well, that's gonna 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 result in a in a better product. If you know, as I like we like to say, you know, healthy soil equals healthy plants. Healthy plants equal healthy animals. Healthy animals, healthy people. Healthy oceans, healthy climate. So it's all it's all tied in. So there's more the more nutrient dense foods, and if you take care of the soil, we've forgotten about that. Definitely need to do that. And then here's a here's someone from forty thousand acre shareholder Natasha Wallace in Uganda get started. Yeah, folks on coffee, mushroom, cacao, cassava. Yeah, we have some projects in Uganda, and we would love to to connect up with you. So if you go to the agroforestry.org, there's actually a section called allies on our website and you can fill that out and then we can learn what you're doing. So we're, we're always looking, we need more farmers to, to do this. One of the, one of the potentials also is, and it's a little controversial is nature based, you know, funding through carbon, carbon credits. So I'll just kind of just share with you my, my thoughts on that. Two or three years ago, you know, I'm like, they're just going to create this scheme for carbon credits, going to allow polluters just to continue to pollute and, you know, you know, yada, yada. And like many, like Ray Archuleta, you know, a star in the film and, and my friend lives in Missouri, and he and I are not big fans of carbon trading. You know, we think we should pay people for planting, you know, cover crops. But, you know, in the 1990s, Al Gore and the UN, you know, you know, summit back in Rio, they decided to get very binoc, you know, kind of like, like, you know, narrow in on this carbon and not, you know, ignore biodiversity, ignore soil health, ignore water flows, ignore, you know, some of those things. And it is what it is. So we're running with it, you know, and the, and the major investors. So about a year ago, I decided to kind of change my tune the, the, in terms of carbon credits. The reality is, if you look at the 
at, at what we're going to what we're going to you know release in carbon greenhouse gas emissions the next five years i i estimate we're going to increase it by six percent if you take the legacy load that we have whatever's in the atmosphere that's baked in that's causing all these challenges we're going to increase it by six percent if you put elon musk as the czar of the world and everyone had to do what elon musk said or what he could convince you and you we doubled down on electrification maybe we did hydrogen you know you know we told gazillionaires that if they're going to fly in their jets they're going to have to invest in 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 soil advocacy you know i mean elon could come up with very very creative we'd be lucky to get to a four percent increase so if we did all these amazing programs in five years we're going to increase emissions by four instead of six it's essentially a rounding error what we do and this is like my environmental friends in the climate movement and a lot of people are going to get very upset when i say this but what we do in terms of burning fossil fuel and we're now we're just with war in russia it's just burnt it's drill baby drill we're going to do more natural gas we're going to do giant huge facilities to compress the natural gas ship it on oceans burn more fuel all this stuff but it's not going to matter what happens to droughts and extreme weather events in the in the coming five to five to six seven years and we know it's getting accelerating the one future the one where we can actually start to really make a turnaround is nature-based and restoring nature so my view if if you want to if if salesforce or microsoft or shell oil you know they realize they can't cut back their emissions very fast they they want to tell you this but the reality is they really don't have a plan to cut it back we'll be lucky if we cut it back by 10 percent in the next five years and, and it's actually going to increase because of the of the the geopolitical and and war things going on that if they want to take that money and and uh, put aside us you know hundreds of billions or trillions and invest it in planting mangroves that you know sequester carbon four times faster than than than, than tropical forests and if they want to invest it in uh, holistic grazing and, and and restoring grasslands you know there's a gentleman named alejandro that's in chihuahua mexico he's going to be the star in the next second follow-up to kiss the ground called common ground carrillo he's been able to just with cows and moving them he's been able to restore the desert and the dry areas in in chihuahua mexico and they're now able to have 10 times the amount of cows running the land they're bringing back streams that they haven't seen since his grandparent you know grandfather told them they're seeing more grass and we can do that we can invest in those kind of things we can invest in, in crop rotation we can invest in agroforestry but instead what are we doing we're putting 99 percent in a green techno utopia future a, 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 a basically at a late stage capitalist model that's crashing that's exploding you know that that has we've created war on nature we've created such a dysfunction that 18 year olds and 20 year old young men walk in and start shooting you know little kids we've and and you know you can make all the gun laws you want but you know we have to address the sickness and the depression that we're facing it's because we have a system and i mean all of this th this i'm not saying anything new all of you go yeah but i'm just i'm i can't be canceled i can say these things i don't care what you know what you know what some of my you know my friends you know my a lot of my liberal friends don't like when i talk about this you know but we need to change how we live and if we destroy nature of course people are going to feel there's not a good future and regeneration can do that and in 10 years we can really go but you know wh when are the gazillionaires gonna gonna do this so so i think potentially this carbon credit system has the potential to fund that and and you know so those are some some potential things there um i i have a question about this and i saw claire just brought this up also is how do we make these types of investments that are necess ne necessary sexy to investors right how do we make soil sexy? you know uh, the the here's the here's the problem here's here's let, let should i just can i just kind of like i'll just give you the unvarnished silicon valley would rather spend you know 50 billion dollars on fake you know meat like impossible and beyond that only i mean they're they're investing right now a billion dollars in some seller company they never sold they've never sold one product and it's negative margin 
But you see, they can put it through Wall Street. They can put it through their private equity funds. They can monetize it. It's, but to say, we're going to invest now in regenerating nature. If you can't, if it's not IP protected and you can't monetize it so easily, they're not going to do it. And so th those with the money, they want the return. <clears throat> really what it's going to take, I believe we need gazillionaires and billionaires to say that 50% of their net assets are going to go for things that restore nature. So I'll say as a millionaire, I put a third a 40% or 50% of my assets in those kind of things or more. That's what we need. And so like, if you could say, give me, if you could say, I'll take a, I'll take a 2% return and we're going to buy farmland and restore it. And we only want a 2% return that we're, it's going to take those kind of things, but also potentially can, can a company like a Salesforce or Netflix or an Amazon that, that wants to be more social responsible invest in these regeneration through carbon trading systems? But the verification system is very expensive. You know, like they, you can't even, like our agroforestry projects don't even qualify, but at some point they will, you know. Oh, oh, investing in the supply chain, Jennifer said. What a concept. I mean, Right now, if you're in agriculture in America and you want to sell your wheat, there's like five buyers for wheat. That's it. There's elevators. They control it. It's a monopoly. Same way with beef. So foundations don't want to invest in the middle system, the infrastructure that we need. That's what we need. We need, you know, we need a, like a, a next generation wheat processing. I mean, I went down the rabbit hole and, and investigated that for a while. So. So yeah, and someone said, you know, talking legacy and nature. Yeah, so yeah, it's, we can do that. Another one said, you know, Stephanie, yeah, they can't eat their money, but you see they're brainwashed. You see, we live in this, I mean, I've noticed this, I've noticed this when I was, since, I mean, one of the reasons why I'm kind of outspoken, I do this thing. When I was 11 years old, I was thrown out of my classroom for saying Christopher Columbus didn't discover America. And, and so from that point on, when they, when they, I was thrown out and I said, you know, like, look, the Vikings were here 400 years ago. And I didn't, I hadn't read, I hadn't read about the, the fact that Native Americans were, they were really here thousands of years, but you know, you know, so I just, I haven't believed that I, I, I essentially, it's like a massive brainwashing in society that's gone on. Our parents were brainwashed or grandparents, you know, and you know, it's so effective that the CIA created QAnon to cre create the most radical people to come up and say that there's this conspiracy that that you know you know the the power structure is brainwashing people and manipulating media you know oh and then the answer is Donald Trump <laughs> so you know like it's 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 hard to crack the system but i believe at this point as the western model starts to decay and break down local communities are going to be left on our own and we have to build the infrastructure so start working 100 miles from your house 200 miles that you know and or support i'm supporting other projects in the global south that that is easier but the the social economic and political systems in the united states are very hard to crack um and we're just a dysfunctional society but wherever but i'd also like to say wherever there's danger there is opportunity. So, uh, Brandon has a good question. You're saying that you don't see them as viable unless the philanthropic, philanthropic, wow. Phil, phil, philanthropic. <laughs> you know, like we need, we need reduced rate of return. But you see, the thing is the Bill Gates and all these other gazillionaires, they're saying they're going to give away 50% of their fortune, but the 50% they give away is in a foundation that they then reinvest in Monsanto. And, and, then they, and then they invest in fake meat. And then they give money away to, to major NGOs that won't like, like, did you know Amazon gave away $100 million to five NGOs in America? And, and virtually none of that goes into regenerative ag. It's almost like you can't invest in regenerative ag and, and be invited to the cocktail parties today or even talk about it. It's crazy. You know, now that's starting to break up and I talk to gazillionaires and I'm involved in, you know, with billionaires and on deals. 
but you know they, they want re, you know economic return because it's literally i, I mean I'll, I'll 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 say something that that may not sound too good you're not going to like this the people who are very wealthy today they, they say the ones who are worth like 10 to 50 million they they spend ten thousand dollars a day when they go to europe and you know what they're not satisfied with that they want to spend fifty thousand a day they want they want bigger jets they want better castles and, and they want they want they want a nicer sailing yacht that they can go in the mediterranean and that's literally where it's at so and some of them are waking up and well they wake up in time you know to shift you know this crashing system I, I think the other thing is that Rush, this Russia-Ukraine event, this proxy war the U.S. and Russia are fighting, remember, 30% of all the wheat is controlled by Russia and Ukraine. Set 90% of the, the sunflower, like the fourth or fifth exporter of, 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 of corn, 25% of the world's fertilizer, 50% of neon gas. How many of you have heard of neon gas? I ask this to everybody all the time. Virtually, even when I talk to sophisticated investors, they never heard of it. It's, re it's required to manufacture every computer chip in the world. Guess who controls 50% of neon gas in the world? Eastern Ukraine. Guess who supplies the raw material to make it? Putin. Guess how much they produced in the last 90 days? Zero. Guess how many months of supply the world chip, the chip manufacturers not controlled by China. They have six months supply as of like a few months ago. So we're facing economic dislocation. Every manufacturer from John Deere to Tesla to Amazon servers is facing a, a, a moment of chip shortages. And they're gonna have to lay off people. So, but what this, what this is doing is ultimately this war is making people re understand their local supply chain, their local water, where they're getting their food. So it's going to shake people up and it's going to make people figure out how do we how do we get our food system locally? Because we may not be able to depend on going to a Costco big box store. I know I, I kind of threw out a lot of stuff there and and some people say, well, thanks, John, for giving me the information today. Uh, I, got, I think I got to go. <laughs> So, but that I see the, I mean, I kind of geek out on these things, but the fact that, how is it that, that the American public, nobody, even in sophisticated, I was talking to someone who managed $250 million. He'd never heard of this before today. How is it that, that, that the essential computer agreement, you know, in the United States and England and Germany, we developed an international, you know, manufacturing system. And the one ingredient that you know, that, that you know is controlled by Putin in Ukraine and we went to war and we're trying to destroy him and we didn't even have a plan B. That's how that's how dysfunctional, you know, Joe Biden is or or or, you know, Tom, Donald Trump and the people around him. They're like, you're going to you're going to you're going to like not even have a plan B for your raw materials to make computer chips that goes in everything from toasters to Tesla. So essentially. There is, there is no one who's in control at, a, at an adult level, unfortunately, today. The system, you know, the Americas is a decaying empire. We, we, we used to be, you know, like, like our, our people who are American, our grandparents, great-grandparents, we fought in wars and we built a great country. And, and now we, you know, we're, we're, you know, it's like we, we have all this abundance and it cre all that abundance creates weak people because everything's handed to them. You know, I was just talking to someone today who worked for a natural food company or yesterday, and it's like does a $500 million a year. And they said, why don't we, in, we're buying broccoli. Why don't we, in, why don't we support, work with a California broccoli people? And let's work with a, you know, they said, no, we're gonna get it from Ecuador. Whoever's got the cheapest broccoli, the millennials came in and said, give me the cheapest broccoli. We'll buy that from Ecuador. We're not gonna invest in our local supply. And, and they were, and they, and they go, oh, we'll get more, we'll get, we will make more money and I will get more, I can put more money in my 401k. So it comes down to greed, you know, it's, it's, it's one, of our, one of our challenges. There's a question here that came to me on accident, I think. It says, John, a dominant portion of the working lands in the grain belt are worked by tenant paying rent to landlord. Carbon credit and sequest car for, for sequestered carbon is likely invested as, is like investment in deferred maintenance with opportunity of tax incentives. 
Is that going back to the land, I assume? Yeah, the the that's one of the one of the challenges is that small farms have been the lands have been taken away and it's either larger farmers or institutional some more institutional farmers and yeah they, they those those you know people like bill gates is the largest farm you know i mean i just found out there's some gazillionaire in bellingham washington that's buying up all the local farmland that's that's for you know that's in our in our skagit valley i just found out you know you know so yeah, that's that is an issue, and some of that they're they're going to monetize that, and that's not going to benefit the farmer. One thing I will say though, a lot of these farmlands in the middle of the country are they're going to have to park their tractors, and their combines, and they're going to have to go back to pasture. So we need to stop growing, you know, grains in in eroding you know low lower rainfall areas we need to restore the 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 great you know the 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 tall grass and the medium grass prairies and bring in hooved animals like buffalo and cattle and in three years as ray archuleta says you can you can bring back the natural mimicry of, of, of biomimicry of the land and you'll get back the native grasslands and and that's that's our best source of protein you know, instead of, you know, drill, you know, disking and growing, you know, peas to, to ship around the world to make fake burgers. Now, now, now those are going to have a role, but I think, I think regenerative agriculture systems, but the problem is you have, you you have, you've convinced people, environmental organizations, people in the coast, the, what I call the woke left, you know, I've, I've been a long time progressive and liberal, but I, I, I almost think that the liberal, you know, dominant thinking has gone insane, you know, and, and they and they believe that cows are evil. They, they're basically cow racists, sheep racists. And they, you know, and, and so, yeah, has cows and sheep done some bad things? Yeah. Well, you know, like they're, they're almost like kind of like Joe Biden, you know, like talking about, you know, and, Bill, you know, Hillary Clinton talking about, you know, young black men as predators. You know, you know, so we, you know, you, when you start classifying entire species or races, you know, you, you know, you're, 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 you're kind of going down the wrong path. So that when you, when you bunch the cattle up and you move them, you know, from pasture to pasture, but we don't, we don't do that. But we, I think we're going to need that to restore lands because we can't depend on this rain. I mean, you know, I mean, you look at, you look at what's going on in Eastern, Eastern Colorado and Western Kansas. It's very tough right now. These, these crops, you know, India's having a problem. India just stopped, just banned export of wheat. So definitely, definitely important. Oh yeah, when the pandemic started, I told my sister to buy plants for the garden. Now they think I'm psychic. It's not superpower, it's logic. <laughs> no, I've heard yeah, over yeah. and over again, if you are not planting and if you are not growing, you are behind. You have yeah, to yeah, get. yeah, definitely important. Here's what is your advice for those trying to move markets for regenerative ag and going after catalytic capital? I think... Yeah, I think getting, you know, getting the right team, the right people, you know, it's all about people. So uh, I think there's a real opportunity to, to like reach out to people who are semi-retired. You know, people are in their 50s or 60s that, that have experience in CPG and ag that want to participate. You know, don't, don't have your team all be old white men. You know, whenever, whenever I get a business plan, when there's, there's five men that are all in their 50s or 60s, I go, uh don't think this is going to turn out too well. You know, you know, we need more women leadership, more BIPOC, and and they bring a diversity. I, I certainly helped me a lot in running Nativa. You know, doing that. Yeah, talk about Buffalo. Buffalo are also excellent, and there's a lot of projects going on around around Buffalo. They're very they're very great, and they don't eat some of the native native herbs. And Buffalo, they actually they 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 turn over and and they rub their back, create these divots that the water holds. Interestingly. There's a there's a there's a program in in the dry lands in Africa where they're doing large holes. They're digging holes like a like maybe like six inches deep or something like that. And and uh, maybe, you know, maybe the size of a car. And and they're doing that all over. And the and that's capturing the rainwater and 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 slowing the flow and helping helping um, percolation. And they're restoring large areas that way. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. And but the other thing is, I think grains is going to be the key to survival. So I'd encourage all of you to where where can you grow 
especially like wheat or oats and and get what and try to get like you know like i wanted to put in a local processing facility in kansas and we couldn't raise the two million dollars to do it the gazillionaires wouldn't back me i'd sold a billion dollars with organic foods but they're like nah nah you know you know maybe i didn't pitch it to the right ones but definitely getting access to that you know we could supply 25 percent of our calories when things get really tight so i mean i think there's going to be this food crisis coming in the next in the next few years and and if the and if and if the the, the scenario i see is either either you know ukraine you know beats back russia you know here in the next two or three or four or five months which i think is a which is a low possibility or they do a regime change low very low possibility if that doesn't happen and they decide to fight a war for the next couple of years and there's a reason why henry kissinger has just said that we should do a peace treaty with russia right now even though everybody you know i mean it's you know, when you have people who are killing you and stealing your lands, it's hard to do a treaty. It's easy for maybe for us for to say that. But if th this war continues on, essentially, it's going to crater our economy because because Putin's mined the harbors and he's and he's not allowing these grains and things to move. If that happens, it's going to get very serious here in the next couple of years because there's just a shortage of food. We can't even get baby food. Baby food, the number one ingredient you know, oil and bay food is, is sunflower oil. It's not just an FDA shutdown, but definitely look at, at and there's a, there's a mill in Oregon called the impact mill. It costs about $150,000. You need other material around it. It's much better than stone mill. It's lower labor cost. I'm a big fan of that, but you should definitely be getting grains processed in your local regions. And also in Africa, cassava could be in, and in, in Central America, you, it's a replacement for wheat. So there's a lot of potential for cassava for that so we, we 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 need to grow more more material you know more food and 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 work with work with the resources and people we have it's going definitely going to be some hard times but you know we're going to get to know our neighbors more and better to focus on that now until when the crisis hits okay well you've got me thinking about the the mill for green yeah, yeah. fiber right and it's a whole new subject to <clears throat> add yeah dry beans there's also someone says what about what about the growing gluten allergies what's an alternative to wheat yeah yeah and i'm in that category i i don't have a severe gluten allergy but i have a you know significant you know decent one when you grow the ancient variety the heirloom varieties like turkey red there's another one in one in uh sonora white and people don't seem to have the allergens issues with it not celiac but uh, I and also Kamut, they have a different gluten structure. So modern wheat that was developed since the 1940s has a higher gluten level. And then they've, so the sensitivities in my view is the increased gluten levels and the destruction of our, of our bi biome in our bodies from Roundup and glyphosate. But these other air, heritage varieties have less of an issue. So you can grow it. The yield's about 50%. So that's something to, something to look at. Okay. Well, thank you very, very much. I could keep talking. I'd love to have you on. I know there's going to be a ton of questions that continue to come in. I see there's a lot that I hadn't even gotten to, but I would love to have you back. I would love to continue this and of course, grow our reach. So we hit more people, spread the word so much more into our local communities as well. Do you have anything that you want to close with or anything you want to share? Yeah. Before we yeah. I, I wanted to say Snackavist. I was listening that there that I was just talking to Joni. I was interviewed on her her podcast. Ev, Ev, she's really focusing on regenerative grains and 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 in northern Idaho. But but yeah, try you know try some of these other varieties, these gluten free varieties. Also, I'm a big fan of mung beans. Mung beans is a great crop to to grow, and you can store it a long time. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and um, check out our film. Check out the coming film. It will be called Common Ground. It'll be out next year, you know. And yeah, just keep up all the all the good work everyone's everyone's doing. And um, yeah, appreciate you having me on on today. You can you can follow me on LinkedIn. And that's where I post a lot of things. And also also Facebook. And I have a Substack. Maybe you could put it in my Substack as well. And and um, yeah, there's there's uh, yeah hosting a, yeah yeah we definitely want to host some some screenings. It'll probably be out sometime you know you know the end of next year. And we're still they're still working on that. But Substack, I write a lot of different articles. I also talk about the pharmaceutical agenda. I'm not anti-vaccine, but I'm I'm uh, 
I'm for science, not for authoritarianism. So I'd appreciate again the the, the chance to talk and keep up keep up the good work and 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 let's uh, let's get more organic regenerative hemp growing and other crops. Oh, well, John, thank you so much for joining. Thank you, everybody else that logged on. If you have any questions specifically for John or you want to try to reach out to him or have, have specific topics that you would like to address or bring back, please don't hesitate to share them with me or reach out to John, like you said, on LinkedIn. If you found anything useful today, please share about this, talk about it, put the word out that we're here. We continue to do this on a regular basis. Thank yeah. you very much, everyone, and we'll see you guys next week.